The Economy Committee, some members will be attending this morning's meeting via video conference and our witnesses will be briefing us via video conference. The meeting will be broadcast live and a recording will be made available on the committee's web pages on the Assembly website. And just to remind members to mute their tablet devices. Um, okay, so moving on then I am to item number one, apologies, and we have apologies from John Stewart and we send John best wishes to get well. Um, item number two then is our draft minutes. We have no other apologies. No other apologies, no, no, just John. Um, so item number two then, draft minutes. Uh, there is a copy of the draft minutes of the meeting held on the 2nd of December at page five of the pack. Um, are members content that that's an accurate reflection of the meeting? And then <coughs> at um, page 10 of your pack, there is a copy of the draft record of decisions because members had to take some decisions by correspondence last week. So are members content with those? Yep. Yes, thank you. Sir, can I just raise something in relation to the matters arising from, from the last meeting? We're going to come back to matters arising after the briefing. No, so. Deputy Chair means from last week. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Sinead. Um, yeah, I know it's just uh, that in page 10, just say... Um, Maybe it is this one. Uh, the record of decisions. I just want to kind of draw attention to the first one there about um, the response from the Minister pro providing clarification in relation to the bus and coach operators for about applying to Part B of uh, the service. Um, I raised about the taxi drivers again, because this is so repetitive, but anyway, I raised that the fact that they couldn't apply for the Part B, they were, uh, it, was an indica it was indicated in eligibility that it didn't apply to taxi drivers. I really do think our committee needs to go back to the department and to the minister and ask why. Uh, you know, the, the, the scheme that has currently been operated by the Department of, of Infrastructure is just an overhead, um, it's just an overhead payment. It's nominal, really. It's not supporting um, their business being down or not operating effectively. You know, they see themselves as part of the supply chain. And I really think that this committee needs to either bring a motion to the Assembly because we're not getting anywhere. We keep on asking the same questions. We're going around in circles. This is one industry that has been failed time and time again. And there seems to be a dig in or a ping pong between you know, the Department of Infrastructure, the Department for Economy, and really every other industry is, is, is supported through the Department for Economy. We need to get this sorted. So if it means a debate or a motion being put on the table, should this committee not do something like that? Because other than that, we're really talking into empty space here. Coming back to this in uh, under chair's business, because I had suggested last week that we would uh, go back to the minister and ask that um, taxi drivers and coach operators, which are clearly part of a supply chain, would be incorporated into the Part B of the CRBSS. Um, I think, Peter, it's something that has been Back, going back and forth between the two departments and the two ministers um, and my suggestion would be that we write to um, TEO and ask that the task force that has been put in place looks at this particular issue because these people really need to get support and they need to get support as quickly as possible um, and if there is difficulties in, in terms of working out between the two departments then it needs brought together. Chair, we copy that then to um I think if we copy to the Economy Minister, but also the Finance Minister and, and the Infrastructure, um, infrastructure Minister as well, all the committees as well. So if we write... I'm, I'm feeling that. I think we actually have to just put a motion to the Assembly. Because I, I, the there's no logic in it. There's no logic. We also have the Minister coming into it next week, so it's an issue to, that we to can To talk about the schemes, Chair. ...with the Minister directly as well. Yeah. But obviously there's a great deal of frustration there, and I think that we do need to get it resolved. <coughs> Gordon? Chair, yeah, yeah, thanks for that. The, the Department of Infrastructure, have they made a payment, an initial payment? <laughs> oh, <laughs> initial payment. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. Sure, that, that's been the problem, and is that's it? Currently, that's currently taking place now. I think it started last Friday, the payments have gone on. But, you know, uh, Gordon, is this is small, a small amount of money. Why is it so um, small? Mechanism. Pardon? I think part of that's mechanism, so it's like a, a one-off payment, whereas yeah. to do the um, CRBSS Part 2, you've got to have a different mechanism, and that's that's what you've had with the support mechanisms before it goes through the same system. 
So there was only a certain amount of budget set aside for the initial payment. This has a, I won't say it has a bigger budget necessarily, but there's a mechanism there that can then be um, accounted. So the other thing about them, a lot of them are self-employed. They should have been eligible for the self-employed scheme. Mm -hmm. oh. Subject to tax returns, I suppose, to be yeah, honest. Well, that's that, and therein lies the problem. But they're all registered, Chair. The they, um, Department for, the, for Infrastructure has the registration. You know, those who are claiming are registered taxi drivers, you've got to have a, uh, a licence. We're, we're, we're pretty well regulated here on that. Um, so they're all known, and, and I think that's, that's part of the issue that has arisen. Is because they've got from one particular scheme, uh, the minister, in a response, had said, "Well, that they won't be eligible." However, you have the likes of potentially hospitality yeah, or tourism, who have benefited from more than one scheme as well, but are still eligible yeah. for new schemes as they come along, because a lot of the schemes are finite. And this is particularly for people impacted by the current restrictions in the supply chain, which they are. So yes. it makes absolute sense that they would be able to access that support. The, the chair, the correspondence we've had has indicated that because of the tail off in tourism and even people just going on, on day trips and things like that, their business has been, certainly particularly for the coach and bus drivers, has been decimated. Oh, yeah. Taxi drivers have seen a huge fall off um, because people aren't able to go out. You know, tourists aren't coming in and having to, to go different places. So if, if members are in agreement, um, we write to the task force, we copy to economy, finance and infrastructure and the relevant committees as well. Yeah. And is that to you? Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yep. Thank, thank you. Thank thank you. you. So we're moving on then straight into our briefing. Which, um, and can we bring our witnesses into the spotlight? We just so, Chair, we have Alison, but Adrian's not there, but Alison might be able to clarify. Okay. So um, item number four then is our briefing from Fermanagh and Oman District Council on broadband provision and project stratum. There's a clerk's memo at page 20 of your pack. Correspondence from Fermanagh and Oman District Council uh, on Project Stratum at page 23, and then there's the departmental response on Project Stratum at page 24. Um, so, welcome to the meeting this morning, Alison McCullough, who is Chief Executive of Fermanagh and Oman District Council. Um, Alison, I think we were expecting Adrian as well, and I'm not sure, is he joining us? No, Chair, my understanding is Adrian has another commitment. He tried to reschedule but was unable to, but I can certainly give an update from Mid Ulster's perspective as well. That's great, thank you. Alison, I'll hand over to yourself then to, to give us a, an opening and briefing, and then we'll open up to members. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks, Chair, and thanks, members, for, the, for this opportunity. I was tempted to, uh, uh, well, play with the technology to assume our connections were very bad, but entering into the spirit of things of our discussion today. I'm mindful as well, Chair, that our correspondence to you has been in, in the context prior to the formal announcements that we've had recently on Project Stratum. So what I thought I would do is just set a little bit of the background and then maybe some commentary on the issues that we would have in relation to the, the rollout of the programme. Um, and I suppose just to say that from a Fermanagh and Oman and a Mid-Ulster perspective, we've worked very closely on broadband issues. Our most recent joint meeting of our two working groups was on Monday evening. Um, we have the unpleasant um, distinction of it being regularly referenced in the Ofcom Connected Nations reports as two of the worst regions in the United Kingdom in terms of broadband connectivity. And just to give you um, an idea of what that is, from a Fermanagh and Doma perspective, uh, our availability at the most recent Ofcom reporting was just at 68% uh, who would have access to decent, uh, super fast broadband, 14% at ultra fast, and I suppose also significantly is 21% of our uh, residents are unable to access speeds of 10 meg megabits from a fixed landline. Um, we have broadband working group that's been working now for over four years on a cross-party basis, really emphasising the principle that broadband is now a key utility. It is something that I think has gained greater credence given the uh, a COVID pandemic, and we see very clearly how broadband is re or reliable broadband is required for education, for health, and for all ma manner, manner of uh, social and community life, as well as, of course, economic and business development. 
It's fair to say, Chair, that I think all of us would welcome the announcement on Project Stratum and 165 million of public funds um, into making broadband better can only be a good thing. Our own Council's position, and again, Mid Ulster, we certainly were of the understanding that what was going to happen when the original confidence and supply funding was announced was that the worst areas would be addressed first and we would work backwards from those. Um, the difficulty that we have had in previous broadband interventions, and I'm, I'm mindful many of you will be aware of this, is value for money is often used as a test and that typically negates uh, against rural areas and those which are hardest to reach. Um, as, as it happens in the context of the fibrous announcement, and we've seen now from their, what looks like their fairly final um, deployment arrangements that have been published, um, that the most hard to reach communities are at the very end of the deployment time frame. So that would certainly give us some cause for concern. There may well be very logical build reasons for that in terms of fibre network, but it's certainly something that we're seeking clarity on. I suppose a couple of other key items, Chair, and this is something that the, um, the committee, no doubt, has, has also considered. You'll be aware in the work towards the announcement of Project Stratum, there had been a variety of uh, communications from the Department for the Economy in terms of their open market review, um, their postcode checking and what were defined as the white and grey areas. Now, what that means from us on a local basis is that a significant number of postcodes have been removed from the eligible inter intervention area for Project Stratum. It certainly uh, wouldn't correlate with our findings at a local level. And we have recently commenced within the Council a crowdsourcing project to, to develop our own broadband data set. Uh, the consultation for that is ongoing, or communication is ongoing, and it'll close on the 29th of January. But in summary, prior to the announcement on the Project Stratum, we had just over 2,390 premises which were removed from the eligible area. And on officially from a project stratum basis, we understand that there are um, really quite a significant number, over 600 premises are formally out of scope. That is almost double um, the, next le the next highest level of out of scope premises, which would be Mid Ulster. We're unclear as to how that has been defined, and it's certainly something that, that we're working with the, both the department and Fibrous on at the moment. Um, so just maybe to, to focus in terms of the, the deployment specifically, Chair, the first areas um, you, you will have seen in terms of the map that many of the areas that will benefit in the first 12 to 18 months of intervention are typically those that are relatively well served from broadband provision at the moment. Um, from our perspective, the first area within our district will be Enniskillen, and that is scheduled for deployment in and around autumn uh, next year, 2021. We then move into Fintana, um, for those of you who know in West Tyrone, um, in spring 2022. And then we move into uh, Oma and Garrison, which would be West Fermanagh in summer 2022. But the three most difficult areas to reach historically for us, which are Gorchen, in Newton Butler, and the areas in and around Kesh are not until the very end um, of the, the programme. Sorry, Derry Lynn um, is, uh, and Gorchen are winter 2023, and Newton Butler and Kesh are autumn 2022. So really what we're trying to clarify is the reason for the deployment, where it is planned in that way, the formal confirmation that the funding will be there and the intervention will be intact. And we're also trying to map back in the context of those postcodes that we deem as eligible, which have been removed from um, the department's reckoning at this point, how that has happened and what the proposed intervention for those will be. I suppose then in, in concluding, Chair, um, the, the main issues that we would have is ensuring that the, the fibrous intervention is rolled out, that the areas that this we believe this funding was intended for do genuinely benefit. But there has been some talk of late now around nearly Project Stratum Plus or the top up to Project Stratum. What does that look like? How do we get to a situation where the, pro the areas and postcodes that traditionally have not been able to benefit from any broadband intervention, and that is again the case 
with this programme? How are they going to be met? They're right across Northern Ireland. How do we ensure that the funding for those is secured? Because I think if we're serious about bringing everywhere to a level playing field, those hardest to reach also need to be um, included. And surely it would make sense when we're looking at the infrastructure deployment overall that, um, that this would now be part of the consideration. In that regard, Chair, just to say that you, you will be aware of our work on the Mid South West Growth Deal, which includes uh, Fermanagh and Oma, Mid Ulster, and Armagh City, Banbridge, and Craigavon, we are looking at the potential of the digital connectivity strand within that program, maybe being able to be utilised as a as a project stratum top up, and that's discussions that are on underway, uh, both with the executive as well as with the treasury. So just some some thoughts, really, Chair. Very happy to take any uh, queries and comments, and do recognise that. This is a work in progress and really a lot of the project stratum information from Fibrous is still very new for all of us. Um, Alison, thank you very much for that. It was really um, useful to get that, that feedback. Um, I guess all of us would uh, likely share the, the um, sentiments around um, the need for those furthest from broadband to be able to get access to it and um, access to it quickly and, and certainly from, from my perspective that that's a priority. Um, it's some of the information that you have outlined there in relation to postcodes um, uh, that have subsequently been removed. We would be really happy to hear further in relation to that once you have that information. If you would be willing to share it with the committee, it's something obviously that we would like to have an eye to use as well. And in relation to those, um, those as you, you mentioned, that will likely be missed from, from the project stratum going on, on the briefing so far that we've had that information in relation to those furthest away. Um, again, that's something that we would like to, to keep in touch with you. Um, I have a, a number of members looking in for questions, so um, thank you. Um, Gary wants to come in first of all. Can we bring Gary into the spotlight, please? Thanks, Chair, and uh, thanks, Alison, for coming along and, and uh, giving us your views today. Uh, just a couple of quick questions. Um, you mentioned in terms of the broadband working groups of both for Council and Mid Ulster Council uh, working together, uh, and you had said that there was a recent meeting uh, on the uh, Did you attend that meeting? It, no, Chair, I'm afraid I had a clashing meeting, so I wasn't there, but uh, my colleagues were in attendance. I've had a briefing from it, though. Yes, uh, so, so just to be clear, the working group meetings were with Fibrous. Uh, the Department for the Economy were represented in that as well, my understanding. Right. And, and it, seemed, it seemed to be that the feedback from that meeting that, that members were more reassured in terms of more clarity. Uh, but I appreciate, Alison, that there are concerns around uh, ensuring that we get, get to those harder to reach. Um, how many properties in total then? I, I'm looking at a document here that Fibrous had provided in terms of the coverage post stratum. So they say that when stratum is, is completed, 98.9% um, of Fermanagh and Oma will be will be covered. Uh, and and they, they, they point out, I suppose, as a way of uh, analysis that, you know, they put it into perspective, Liverpool's 96%, Manchester's 96%, so it, it'd be much greater than those areas. Uh, how many properties in total will be uh, dealt with under the scheme in Fermanagh and Oma? Well, well, Chair, that's a question we have in into Fibrous as well. I have the similar data as you have, um, Gary, in terms of the, the indication around percentage spread. What we have tried to clarify is in total from the start of this project, we have an estimation, I'm just looking at my own records, that over 900, the guts of 1,700 postcodes have been removed from the start of our work with DFE. So what we're trying to clarify is, is the 97% based on the remaining eligible postcodes or the area as a whole? Um, in terms of those areas that are definitely outside, and that's why we're doing the crowdsourcing on this, it doesn't correlate to the information that our members are getting at a constituency level from people who have, it's been advised, have access to more than one broadband provider. Yes. And when you refer to, yeah, yeah, when you refer to, refer to the, the around 600 that were mentioned by Fibris that were out of scope, is that 600 in the, the entire council area? Yes. Yes. 
Uh, I'll tell you now, Chair, so that's across the area in total, yeah. Um, it is a total, let me just confirm, 612. And the next ranked is Mid Ulster, uh, which are 354. Yeah, so, so what so we're trying to, to define just is what out of scope actually means. And if there are clusters, uh, our sense is that this means there are areas defined that are out of scope as opposed to random premises across the district. Yes, okay. No, thanks for that, Alison. Uh, that's useful. I suspect that uh, uh, what I have found from Fibrous and from the department is that, they, they, you know, they have been quite um, they've been quite clear or they've been quite useful in terms of providing the information, uh, for, certainly from the meetings that I have had. And I think that it is important that that ongoing, um, that ongoing conversation can continues to happen. And clearly your working groups, uh, it's actually a very good initiative because Mid Ulster and Fermanagh and Omer are clearly the two uh, most affected. But but I do think as well that we need to ensure that we we get to that point where, uh, as I say, ninety eight point nine percent coverage, in my opinion, is a fantastic position to be at. And the focus needs to be on ensuring that we can deliver on that uh, over the next number of years. But I do appreciate you you coming along today. Thanks, Alison. Okay. Thanks for that, Gary. Um, and that that's useful. Um, Stuart. Yep, thanks, Chair. I appreciate very much just the, the, the catch up, and, and I think we all appreciate that this is early days for Fibrous. And I, I, let us hope that they will cooperate and discuss and, and indeed negotiate with you because even though they will have their rollout plans, um, there would be a hope that um, if you can identify a particular issues as to why they should do somewhere sooner rather than later or the connectivity is, 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 uh, of rollout is better achieved in some way. These things are much better resolved collectively rather than one side trying to impose their, their view on things. But my, my question is actually in relation to um, what, it, what, if any, and I probably should know the answer to this question, what, if any, cross-border cooperation is there in respect of this? And are some of those very difficult to get to communities perhaps better served by connectivity from uh, border counties, from counties in the Republic? Um, and is there, is there any level of cooperation or uh, any level of, of arrangement between Fibrous or others uh, on a cross-border basis to deliver either to deliver some of those hard-to-get bits or to deliver even a, even a higher percentage? Yeah. Um, Chair, I think, I think it's the right approach. Um, we are council together with, um, obviously, Mid Ulster and Armagh, Bambridge and Craigavon are part of ICBAN, which is the Irish Central Border Area Network. ICBAN would have done a, a couple of reports which were called Fibre at the Crossroads. It was done over two, really two substantive reports. And one of the things they looked at specifically was cross-border cooperation in the context of the Irish government's national broadband plan. Now, at that stage, um, and indeed I'm mindful of the, the, uh, the composition in terms of the fibre board, at that stage it was obviously more advanced than Project Stratum. Project Stratum was a proposal but it was certainly mooted the potential for cross-border cooperation from infrastructure providers in those areas that have been uh, traditionally the most difficult to reach right across the border on both sides of the border. Now, my understanding at that stage was that uh, because of the difference in the contracting methods, it was unlikely that that could be formalised, but informal cooperation, and particularly if maybe a bidder was part of a consortium, there could be practical cooperation uh, identified for those interventions to happen. It's something that we have raised with Fibrous in the context now of their recent award to see what scope uh, would exist. But I think until we get the detail in terms of the properties that are fully out of scope and where they are, it's, ha it's hard to work out where the cross-border, uh, whether there would be suitable um, networks, if you like, for cross-border cooperation to happen. I'd be very surprised if, if there's not. Mm -hmm. Certainly in the region for us between uh, Monaghan, Fermanagh, we would have some, I'm aware, also of areas, uh, obviously between Derry and Donegal as well, as well as between Uraid and Louth in particular. So I think um, it's something worth, worth pursuing. Also mindful of the recent announcements around Shared Island, and I know that it's particularly focused on built infrastructure, uh, but it may well be something that connectivity could be a strand of, of uh, funding that could be pursued there. 
charge is set. Obviously, I understand the issue around uh, the various contracts, but at the end of the day, a piece of fibre cable is a piece of fibre cable, and the reality is that if there's one on one side of the border and one on the other, and it's easier for the two to connect and work together, then we need that is absolutely clear cooperation that is required. Um, I think we would like to hear more from you once the picture starts to clear around all of this. But I think, Chair, we need to make a very clear uh, point about writing to the Department to encourage that cooperation and indeed uh, see what we can do with the, the counterparts in the Republic as well. Yep. Happy to do Thank that. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Gordon? Yes, thanks very much, Alison. We uh, welcome and uh, thanks for your presentation. I suppose it's a bit native of Fermanagh, I have to admit that very much aware of, of the problems, but I've moved to another area some years ago and we're, we're left behind. Now, we're not going to get any broadband about 2023 20, <laughs> in the Arch North Down area, but um, so I think there, you know, the priority has been fairly well focused towards the West, as you can see. The contractor, you probably met with Fabris, or some of your staff have, I understand. <coughs> I had a meeting involved with a party meeting with them last week, so I think we're very impressed with the hands-on approach they have. Uh, they're based in Mid-Ulster and their training, I believe, is in Pool Island. So I think, you know, um, the focus is very much, on, I believe, on the rural areas, and rightly so. That's where the problems exist. Are you aware of the, the proposals, really, is to be based around existing infrastructure? Uh, obviously using, for example, a lot of it will be BT systems they'll be using, and then there'll be... Um, amending and working with them. They have agreement, are you aware that the full agreement to, to share facilities uh, and not to have to come along and initially run in new, new systems totally. They're going, to, they're going to share what exists. So I think the fact that BT has been in existence for in your constituency for a number of years, uh, it's a matter of really, really of an upgrade. So I think the whole engineering of it should be fairly simple and, and should move fairly quickly. Yeah. No, I, I certainly that's my understanding as well, Chair. And, um, you know, I would be, I'm sorry if it doesn't sound it, I would actually be approaching this as glass half full, but it's just to ensure that the uncertainties are satisfactorily resolved as well. Um, inherently, this is a good investment. It's a good thing. But as I say, I would be concerned that historically the areas that have not benefited don't appear to be benefiting from this. And, and I hope um, that is not the case. I, I would certainly concur in terms of the engagement from Fibrous and their willingness. And uh, indeed, they're, they're also working on the local full fibre network uh, programme. And obviously, we're a partner within that. So we are aware of their, their willingness to be hands on and to engage directly with the councils. And um, that's something we'll certainly continue to, um, to develop as this project unfolds too. Yeah, I suppose uh, your main concern is on a day-to-day -day basis, what motivates and drives them to, to work to their plan, to cover the whole area? It's easy to go into Enniskillen, for example, and get 100 or 1,000 properties picked up. But if you go to, to Derry Lynn or, or Cash, you're going to be working, you may be picking up a few hundred at a considerable excessive expense. So I suppose how that, that is managed and how that is driven is important throughout the project. I think that has been always the case. And I've heard this argued that rural areas missed out because they felt uh, it, it was difficult to justify the cost. And that, that issue was never addressed, really, because it takes so much money to run in a system for three houses where you could move into an area and get 300 houses. So I think the ongoing progress of that and monitoring of that is critical. No, I agree with that, Chair, and I think it would be remiss of me not to highlight, I suppose, from our councillor's perspective, the particular concern that rural, including the most remote parts of our district, as well as from Northern Ireland, have an equal and full right to broadband services. So the, I think our members' concern is that there will be uh, delineations within rural, so there will be some that will be supported and some that just won't for whatever reason. And it's to ensure that we are bringing as many of the properties and uh, residents as we can on these interventions. And as I say, in, in the context of uh, COVID, we have seen how in particular um, health care and education are now entirely dependent 
on broadband working effectively. And we are already talking in, in some of the areas that are currently outside of scope of significant rural dis disadvantage and deprivation. And we don't want a further filter in terms of a, a digital connectivity issue as well. Every area virtually should be covered by it. The fact that they're using ex existing infrastructure in the main, you know, it should be cost effective, and let's hope it will be be very successful. And uh, we're certainly all pushing, and we will be monitoring it closely from from our perspective here. And we hope areas like Arch and North End will be done pretty soon, and not have to wait to 2023. Thanks very much, Alison. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Gordon and John. Uh, thank you, Alison. Alison, can I just go over the figures with you again? Did you mention that originally there was two thousand around two thousand properties removed from the scope, and then an additional six hundred? Yeah. So j just to go through in terms of the figures, so our initial mapping, um, which goes back certainly to twenty eighteen, was there was a removal of three hundred and eighty nine. Then there were a further four hundred and fourteen. These are all postcodes removed. Then the final. Map essentially is 972 postcodes, so the, and that's the most relevant. So 972, which cover just over 2,300 premises, have been removed from Project Stratum by the department, um, and the, we don't have a rationale for that. And that would certainly um, run contrary to the information that we hold. But in addition to that. Um, in terms of the information that the department did share and circulate, we have 612 premises that have been defined out of scope of the project. So there's there's project there's postcodes and premises that were not included in the intervention area, and then postcodes that were included in the intervention area that, as we understand, are deemed to be out of scope. And that's what we're trying to clarify what the reason for that is. Could, could you share that clarification when you get it with the committee? Yes, certainly. Ha happy to. And just on, on, on that point, John, I suppose it is a work in progress for us. So I would expect by the end of January, when our survey closed, we're mapping it. We should have this by early February. I'm very happy to, to share. And we are, as I say, uh, working both with the department and fibres in case there are genuine misunderstandings on how the information has been um, uh, displayed or shared with us in case we've got the wrong end of the stick. But there does appear to be an inconsistency. Okay, thank you. And in terms of, uh, you mentioned Anna Skill. Is that Anna Skill in town? That's on the... Yes. You know it, John? I, I used to work at <laughs> it many years ago. You know I know it well. Uh, just, why, is, why, is, why is a town included... <laughs> Gordon's, Gordon's hot, haggling me here. Uh, uh, why is a town included in a, a rural broadband rollout? Surely, what, what numbers are involved in that scale in town? I, I don't have that breakdown available to, today. Now, I'm assuming for some of them will be linked to the Enniskillen Exchange, but will technically be outside of the town centre boundary. Um, but that that is the case. Yes, there will, there will be, and I, I hasten to add, we do have um, connectivity issues, which you might remember within Enniskillen Town, but um, yes, it is included within the scope of the programme. When I was working in Enniskillen, the internet hadn't been heard of. Another chin feeling. The reason I ask, it's obviously a welcome, anyone who received the broadband will be very welcome. I just have concerns in the broader context that we're using public funds to subsidise private companies, and those private companies, in my opinion, have been sitting back for a number of years waiting for public funds to come forward uh, to deliver services to customers. Uh, so I just, I'm just trying to work out where the actual uh, delivery is going to. And, and my final comment is just to support Stuart's, and th again, this is, this is not your issue, but uh, something I think we should all lobby on, Stuart's commentary around the cross-border connectivity in this case. As he says, fibre cables, fibre cable. They'll all be manufactured to European Stop. standards. <laughs> it's a case of plugging it in. It's yeah. probably a service level agreement that's required mm. between yeah. the two providers rather than contracts, but yeah. it's something we should all work on. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, John. Christopher? Thank you. <clears throat> uh, Chair, you will know that I uh, represent South Belfast, and I think in my constituency I have one person employed in farming, and that gives you an indication of just how rural. Uh, South Belfast is, uh, and I know exactly where he lives, he's just beyond carried off, but that's neither here nor there. Um, 
I, I, the First Minister would never forgive me if I didn't say, with a population of 13,000 people, I don't think anyone could really call in a skill in a major conurbation. And I think it's important that you know it is included in the in the in the programme. I missed the opening element of the uh, the presentation, so forgive me if, if I'm asking something that has been answered. In terms of the postcodes that have been dropped, where exactly are they? In terms of localities or, or do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yes, yeah, Chair. There, sorry, they're across our district. So if you take the district as a whole, they, there have been postcodes dropped uh, literally across the Herman and Oma district. Um, now, we, can, we have that mapped. We can certainly share that with you. Um, there are Some of them are clusters, and some genuinely appear to us to be anomalies because as in the, the early removal of postcodes, it related to if there was more than one broadband provider in the area. And if, if you like postcode A, has one broadband provider post or sorry A and C have two B seem to be removed in the middle, um, so there, there are certainly gaps in the context of the information as we have it, but we do have it mapped. Uh, uh, that would be, it would be really useful to have that so that we know basically which communities are being excluded, because and uh, your comment about how COVID has changed things in terms of how we deliver education. And healthcare is absolutely true. And as I say, as someone that lives in the city, even I, in terms of the delivery of education, particularly I'm, I live in the city, but I'm the father of four children, and even I have noticed uh, just COVID has accelerated completely the tilt towards online learning. And it's essential that no child living in a rural community should be excluded from mm. uh, educational resources and learning by virtue of the fact that they happen to live in a rural community. So I, I just that's not really a question, it's just a point. But I would really like I would be really interested to see the mapping, just to see who is being excluded. Um, if we could get that, that would be really useful. No, I agree. Um, certainly the amount of people using broadband now has really impacted on the capacity of it as well. And um, like I had a constituent in contact with me this week who has kids learning at home, daughter at university that has to go to McDonald's car park to be able to do her lectures. So it's, it's really shocking in, in some respects. Um, Sinead, I think you're looking in next. Yes. Um, can you hear me? Yes, okay. Oh, yeah, no, sorry. Thank you very much, Alison, for your uh, briefing this morning. Um, I, I really don't have a question uh, as such, apart from the fact that, uh, you know, I really uh, welcome the, the Project Stratum. It is an immensely important project, uh, particularly for our rural areas, so that they can level up. Um, and, and, and the one thing that I took heart in yesterday, there was question time for the Minister for the Economy and she was asked, there were three questions put to her in relation to Project Stratum. So it is something that, you know, every member of the Assembly is, is very excited about and interested in because we all have constituents that have problems um, accessing broadband. However, um, the, the questions were about a review mechanism. So um, there is a very robust uh, review mechanism in place for the project itself. So there, that, that gives me comfort that if there are problems along the way in the rollout of, of, this, uh, of this project, then there are mechanisms in which you can bring those issues to the uh, fore so that they can rest and brought into the department and I think that that's really important for for a program uh, of 165 million pounds that we make sure that as it has been rolled out that it's meeting the needs of the communities and the people that uh, in which it is uh, supposedly meant to serve so that is at least at least a little bit of comfort as we start this project and roll it out that it can be reviewed by the department uh, on an ongoing basis Thank you again for that, and I, I think that that initiative that you have, the, the crowdsourcing piece, is a, is a really interesting um, is an interesting initiative in terms of getting the information from your own members and from your own constituents. And I think it's something maybe we could take up with Nilga and see if other areas are doing similar. Um, I'm not sure. Do you know if Mid Ulster are doing a similar initiative in relation to that? 
It, it, not at the moment, but I know they're exploring it. So I, I think they're probably likely to do something similar maybe into the new year. Thank you very much, and um, I'm sure we'll keep in touch around this. And, and if you would be happy to share any of the information when, when you have it available, that would be really useful to the committee. No, I will indeed, Chair, and thanks again to, to you and to the members for your time. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank, Thank you. you. All the best. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye-bye. Chair, I've picked up a number of clarifications that are uh, coming out of that briefing, and if members are content, we can take those to the department and Fibrous. Also, um, Alison agreed to share her mapping exercise, and as you, you flagged up, Chair, that it might just be worth getting in touch with Nilga to try and pin down um, just what level of contact there is with councils. And now that we've heard from one council and, and, and specific issues that they have identified, perhaps find out if, if there are other councils that share concerns. Obviously, it would have been um, very useful if, if we could have had Mid Ulster today because they, they'd flagged up there were issues. But just from what Alison had said, certainly the, the worst effect it seems to be for Mana Oma. But she did quote some figures that, that sound that there are some other uh, councils where the um, out of scope mm -hmm. properties have, there, there's a certain number running into the hundreds there. So it might just be useful to clarify with Nilga what they know around that and what councils are, are, are doing and flag up their issues. Yep. Members are content. Yeah, on that, I think it'd be useful. A couple of things to get Fabris in here to yeah. talk to us. Um, yeah, as I said we had a, a meeting with them. A Zoom meeting it was quite informative, and I think they'll be impressed with the the local involvement. And uh, certainly, the, the west of the province is very well represented. The contractors based there, the training is in Mid Ulster and so on as well. And they're you know keen to involve the community, bring in apprentices, mm. and. Uh, just to be involved and to be, to be part of the local communities that are working in. A couple of things, obviously towns that have existing systems, which is uh, quite a part of the case in areas like Ards and North Town, where there are existing systems in town centres, they are not involved in those and will not be part of that, so it doesn't apply there. And John was making the point about Inniskill, obviously they don't have that. Uh, a cable system, towns that don't have it obviously will be, but um, the other thing that they're only using the, the, the cable system or the fibre system now it is they're not using any other options where you could put in satellite dishes, for example. That's not part of it. It doesn't seem to be part of the contract. So um, in their first illustration they showed us was the first job they done really was to put in a, a telegraph pole. And you think, my goodness, is that the way it's gonna work? But that seems to be the way a lot of it is based. It seems to be going to be work on the infrastructure that mainly is owned by BT. And the full authority to move on that, and, and therefore they're, they're going to be. So I think you know it, it will be probably a value for money project, and you know no matter what people say that BT exists throughout the province, no matter where you are, you know to a certain level. So I think um, you know it should move fairly quickly, but it will be. I think it would be informed to get them in, and also to get the department in to see how the whole project has been managed and and how the, the whole funding of it is, yeah. is going to be um, kept monitored. Because I think that's important. It's a huge project, a lot of money involved, and I think we need to make sure that the value for money is delivered. So. If we could get Fabris and the department in to talk about it, I think Chair would be useful. Yeah, no, I agree, Gordon. Um, Peter, maybe it's going to get in the same day. Yeah, we, Chair, we have um, we've already um, requested a briefing with the department, and we'll add Fabris to that as well. They they seem to have reached out a lot to members, so I can't see any reason why they wouldn't be content to come and brief. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Gary is looking in for. Uh, are you looking in? So? Yeah, thanks, Chair. No, it was just to support Gordon's comments. I think it's vitally important that we do get fibrous. I think to a certain degree the, the presentation today was it was useful. I think that there was an element of maybe jumping the gun in terms of uh, it was sent and prior to the council actually meeting with fibrous. And I think that when I spoke to some of the members who attended the working groups, uh, they were reassured, and it was a unanimous reassurance that you know fibrous were doing all they can to get to all of those areas. Uh, which were affected, but uh, as I say, it's just about, I suppose, letting Fibrous get on with their job, whilst we will provide a, a scrutiny piece and ensure that you know, areas are, are, uh, are, are properly serviced. But I think we need to hear from Fibrous first 
uh, before because as I say they're meeting with everybody else anyway uh, so that would be a useful opportunity as a committee for us to get briefed by them as well. Yeah, thanks. Sorry. Stuart? Yeah, it was just a, I, as I came back into the room to, to catch up, I think it's important that we contact all the councils that, that um, through Nilga or whatever to, 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 to get that because and we could all say this there are I mean, Christopher doesn't have too many rural areas, but you know, he takes over like East Antrim. We have got the Antrim Coast, where there's little or no coverage at all. I have one major school uh, in East Antrim, which has to rely on a microwave link uh, provided by BT and a private contractor. Um, and there are lots of hill farms and mm. uh, small, particularly uh, small businesses that rely in relation to guest houses and other tourism activities on the Antrim Coast Road, all of which just have no connectivity. Chair, something also had, had occurred to me, and I don't know whether Mr O'Dowd might be able to answer this. With schools, was there a special project around um, schools getting broadband? And, and does that have any kind of relationship to this? There, they have, I'm not sure it's a, a single broadband provider, but in terms of internet, our internet services, there's a single provider, and I'm trying to think of the name of it now. Um, is that that C2K, no data? C2K, 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 yes, K that's it, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but in terms of but in actual it. broadband connection, I'm not sure how that works. Jared, I'm just, I'm just thinking whether there's a, a dovetail here between the two departments. It might just be worth clarifying with economy mm. um, and education. whether that, that's something that's already been pinned down, whether all schools have appropriate access. Well, they don't. It's, it's not something that the committee has any feedback on. I don't know whether members individually have, but I think it just would be use, yeah, I know useful pinning it down. One of the community broadband schemes that if you have a school in your area you get extra support yeah. for, but um, yeah, I think it would be useful. Chair, um, if, we, if we add that into the letter to the department, um, we can at least then clarify and they can point us in a new direction if we yep. need to. Thank you, Chair. Oh, thank you. Okay, members, then we're going to go back to um, item number three, which is Chair's business. There's a few items under Chair's business this week. Um, at page 15 of your pack, there is a clerk's memo on the Velocity Worldwide informal meeting. Um, at page nine of the table pack, there is um, their slide presentation. And... Um, a few of us met with them last uh, Thursday morning via informal meeting. Um, it was a useful briefing around the, the role of technology in retail, which is particularly relevant at, at this time um, when businesses are, are trying to, to get reopened. Um, I think it, there's some useful stuff came out of it in relation to that, and, and it would be helpful to relay that back to the department. And if John or Sinead, who were also at the meeting, have anything that they want to add? No, I think maybe chair was very useful. Sinead? Oh, you're on mute. Sure. Okay. Um, yeah, no, it was very useful. And I think um, it really is something that probably in best day and I, uh, and that should look at... Um, instead of us it was useful for information purposes only but if, it, if we wanted to go further then it has to go, get into the the, the main thoroughfare of invest ali and into councils so it, it's trying to get a route uh, into that uh for for shane and his or for Enda and his team um to to do that because it is the way forward that people um in retail and businesses in retail uh look at how they can do click and brick at the same time. Yeah. Um, I think that Peter, perhaps if we share it with both the department and invest. Yeah, and, and ask an assessment yeah. um, on what they might be able to do or what they're planning in that direction. Yeah, okay, thank you. So moving on then to 3.2 at page 17 of your pack, there's correspondence from an individual in relation to the newly self-employed support scheme. Um, and as members will be aware, uh, last week after the scheme opened and the eligibility criteria um, were published we had some concerns raised with this I'm sure members were contacted by, by individuals as well um, and we highlighted those back to the department we've had some conversations with officials around those issues um, and I think it, it would be useful if we could write to the minister and, and the, the department and just ask uh, for some clarifications around the, the criteria in relation to the scheme and if some of them will be reviewed um, based on, on the information that has been highlighted. 
Chair, it might also be worth flagging up uh, the department's meeting with Excluded NI today, um, and that should allow a bit more sort of interchange on new information they found out. Been, I know they've been uh, in contact with the HMRC, and, yeah. and they've got a lot of new kind of bits and pieces that they can share with the department. So hopefully we'll get something new out of that today, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, um, so moving on then to 3.3, .3, at page 3 of your table pack, there's a clerk's memo on the skills micro-inquiry. Um, the proposed date for the skills micro-inquiry is Thursday the 28th of January. Members would be um, involved similarly to the last, um, say, or the last um, inquiries in a session for feedback between a quarter past 11 and 12. So we're just asking members um, to, to note the date and to seek agreement that the stakeholder invitation is issued to the list of stakeholders. Um, highlighted, Peter, you want to add anything in relation to that? It's, it's what we have there is, is a, a letter that we send out. And we're, we're, we're very conscious of the fact that we're heading towards the um, Christmas period. So we want to get it out now, get it into um, stakeholders' diaries, and then we do a reminder at the start of the new year. So we're, we're looking at that date, the 28th of January. It'll be the same sort of format as we used for the micro, macro, macroeconomic outlook uh, special report discussion event. Easy for you to say. <laughs> we, we have to think of a, a snappy acronym for this. We're do. Um, so it'll follow that same format, stakeholder roundtable, uh, feedback session with members, report and then bringing for debate hopefully with, within a couple of weeks of that in mid-February. So the, the letter is there to go out and it just explains the, the kind of context. I'd mentioned before very helpfully the department had commissioned um, the OECD to look at local skills, you know, what sort of issues there are, what sort of recommendations they would make. So we've used that as the basis for discussion. With this particular one we've gone for two questions rather than the four. That allows us to have more stakeholders in more groups, but it makes the feedback easier and it means we don't have to extend the sort of feedback time. So we're looking at more around 50 um, stakeholders this time rather than the sort of 20 we'd used for our, our first one because it was our first time and we were still seeing what was manageable. So the, the list of stakeholders is also there. Draft list is there at page eight in the table pack. So we, we've broken it down into um, different groups, education, training, skills, business, energy, tourism, policy development, HR and recruitment, and third sector trade unions, councils and other. Um, so we, we've tried to kind of bring in as many of the people we've met who, who we know have, have something to say. Um, and we'd said to them previously, you know, we'd be doing a, a piece of work on skills and we'd like them to contribute. So we've tried to get everybody we're, we're going to be doing slightly bigger groups in slightly more breakout rooms but we think it'll work in much the same way um the, the only kind of worry we have is the the number of people and and people starting to drop off with picture because you've kind of got to your bandwidth we, we kind of deal with that as we have to but that's for members there to look we, we'll try and send out an invitation before the end of the week but if there's any other um Groups that members want to highlight. Um, Chair Wayne. Yeah, go ahead, John. Yeah, I see Act 2 is invited, um, and obviously they'll pick their delegates, but I think it'll be important to have representatives of colleges and trade or universities' unions. And also, I'm wondering, should we also invite representatives of the Students' Union, who are recipients of much of this training? Yes, mm. exactly. Very good. Yeah. And, and we have all those contacts. Yeah. We, have, we have our contact group there, so no, absolutely. As I say, we... we and can I just emphasise, uh, well, it's up to people who their delegates they send. I think it's important that we hear the voices of college students as well as university yeah. students in that debate. Chair, all of the... Um, well, five of the six um, regional colleges have NUSUSI branches, mm -hmm. so we can contact them yeah. via that branch yeah. network. Southwest College... As a different arrangement, so we'll, we'll work on that separately. But absolutely, no, we, we've sort of got a bit of capacity there to add about another 10 people. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, absolutely, we can go ahead and do that. There, there were a couple of other um, suggestions. We, we talked to the, the, the health committee team, um, and they had suggested a few 
further um, professional bodies. We, we have BMA, but they would suggested the Royal College of GPs as well. Um, they're, they're not bodies, to be honest, I'm, I'm terribly familiar with, and I, I, I don't want to risk duplication, but if members are content, yeah, Peter, we can... And also, um, some, like, the Institute of Physics um, yeah. and the Royal Society of Chemistry that, you know, in relation yeah. to the particular issues around STEM... Chair, well, Chair, I'm just wondering, have we got uh, career guidance in that as well? Yes, Chair, we, we, we've brought, we're bringing in the department's um, career service, basically the career service. The career service, yeah. yeah. Members will remember way back. Oh, sorry, I see the start it. of the year. We had a very good briefing from them, but I think it's something the committee has talked about before in terms of ensuring that all young people have a, a minimum and statutory um, amount of careers service access. It, it seems to be a bit patchy. Um, with some schools, there's a lot of access. Other schools, there's not as much access. So I, I think it'll be useful just to hear from them as to how they see that working, how they want to um, work into the skills strategy that's coming. Um, so no, we can add those additional ones, and, and particularly the... The STEM uh, groups, I think that most of those professional institutes have a group where they feed into on the promotion of STEM. And I know um, there's a, a couple of groups too that particularly focus on getting women, girls and women into STEM as well. So we, we'll go back and have a look at those too. Yep. Gordon? Just the point about why is it not on a Wednesday or on a Thursday? The reason we don't do it on a Wednesday is we can't do it on Starleaf yet. Um, I, ideally, what we'd like is to be able to do the feedback session as part of a committee meeting. Starleaf doesn't allow us to do breakout rooms, so we have to use Zoom. So it means it's not compatible with the system we use on a Wednesday. I'm hopeful, because I know we are feeding back to whoever makes Starleaf for us, um, that we need breakout rooms. And once we've got that done, we'll incorporate that feedback session into a committee meeting. Until we, we're able to do that, in terms of just the system we have to use and the capacity, it means we have to do it on a Thursday. And I appreciate that clashes um, with members of other meetings and committees, but at the minute it's a technical issue for us. What time is it at? So members will um, be at the feedback session, which is 11.15 until noon. Uh, we'll do the roundtable session from 10 until 11.15, but members will come in for the feedback, the, the, the number of rooms. Okay, yeah, the way works yeah. complicated. Um, but ideally, yes, Mr Dunn, we, we will be hoping to bring that as a, a broadcastable thing once Starleaf function has kind of expanded out. Okay. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay, then, moving on to 3.4, we've already dealt with at 3.1. Um, 7.1 from last week's agenda which we've already discussed in relation to taxis and coach operators and we've agreed our actions on that. Um, 7.5 then of last week's agenda with a response from the Minister about the Student Hardship Fund um, and there were some concerns raised about the, that fund being slow and bureaucratic um, in relation to students applying to it and to ask for members' agreement to go back to the Minister asking that the criteria for the funds are relaxed in the current circumstances in the process simplified to allow students to get that funding as quickly as possible. So if members are agreed. Great, great. Thank you. Um, and in last week's agenda as well, there was a request from Future Screens NI to brief the committee and it was just to ask for members' agreement to um, schedule that briefing. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, and then just the final item. Um, since yesterday afternoon, obviously there has been the announcements in relation to some agreement between the EU and the British government in relation to the implementation of the protocol, which obviously after four and a half years of, of difficulty and uncertainty is welcome, particularly for businesses. Obviously, we're all waiting to hear the final detail of that it. It what it looks like. this afternoon. Um, and we were all very aware that the fact that you know the systems and processes <coughs> to allow that trade east west and west east to happen weren't going to be ready so um the <coughs> reported grace periods that have been that will be put in place are obviously welcome in terms of providing some short-term relief um but there's obviously an awful lot of work that needs to be done between now and when those potentially end 
to ensure that there is the, the uh, ability for people to, to trade um, and obviously the issues around the financial support as well to, to both businesses and to, to the executive in terms of being able to put in place infrastructure and to replace the funding. Um, so if members were agreed that perhaps we, we write to the, the Secretary of State in relation to those issues, um, in particular around the engagement with local businesses to get that detail that they will need in terms of the, the practical implementation um, and that, that engagement needs to happen. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously the, the Joint Committee is likely to meet in the coming days as well yeah. and the, the Joint First Ministers will be represented at that and hopefully get the, um, the clarity and the certainty that it is provided. Yep, Chair, we'll go ahead and do that. Thank you. Okay, so moving on then to item number five, which is matters of rising. Page 27 of your pack, there's a minister's response in relation to the impact of the new COVID restrictions. Um, obviously, there are, um, the situation has changed since we, we um, wrote that letter to the minister, so it's for noting unless there's any additional comments. Uh, at page 29 of your pack, then, there is a response from the Minister in relation to the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill, um, and that is one that has been raised a, a number of times in the Chamber and as part of the, the discussion around the bill itself. Um, so, again, it's to note, unless there's any comments. Okay, um, 5.3 then, at page 31, there's the Department response to um, the revision of proposals for the health and safety consequential amendments, EU exit regulations. Um, Peter, is there anything you want to say in relation to that? Chair, sure, this is one of the, the, the technical issues that I now suspect we're going to see an awful lot of. Um, we, we'd already seen these regulations previously with a particular set of wording in it referring to exit day, um, which had been the legal advice at the time, was the right way to go about amending the regulations. Further legal advice based on changing events has meant that that's no longer the phrase that needs to be used, and there's a different phrase um, called IP completion day. So what that means is that they have to change the regulations to put that phrase in instead of exit day, and they're basically flagging up that they're doing that. Right. Uh, we're we're going to see that with... Well, I, I don't even... I'm not even going to put... A suggestion as to how that's going to work with with new information obviously coming out of yesterday some of the regulations that we've already seen through they may have to change wording um, to accommodate new periods of time and other things so just to flag this one up but there will be others so is this really so the ones we'll be looking at later on are some of the students ones as well i've seen that phrase again right? it's the it's the phrase yeah. and the, the legal advice based on what we knew at the time, um, where now we're talking in different terms of time periods. But essentially what it's meant to do is ensure that the arrangements we currently have around um, students studying here in both further and higher education are still able to do that under the current arrangements we have with the EU, that there won't be a disruption for those currently studying and in process. because. You'd be surprised at the number of, of um, EU students we actually have in our FE colleges and so on. Mm -hmm. So it's really just to protect that relationship, that relationship, um, and their their security on those courses going into the new period beyond the transition period. So IP being implementation period, which is now a phrase we're going to use. Potentially that's. One of many phrases. I don't know if that actually Are makes any phrases referred to. But it's really what we're what we're kind of doing at the minute is continuity um, and, and protecting those students that are already on courses um, so that they, they can go through the rest of that course without anything just suddenly dropping off or being told that their their fees are changing or, or, or other issues like that. Um, sure, it might be an opportunity to flag up. Um, members will recall the minister quite a while ago briefed us on wanting to remain in the likes of Erasmus and Horizon 2020. I understand those discussions are ongoing um, and it is hoped that some arrangement can be found just for members to tuck away and, and we, we'll probably talk about that at a later stage when we get more of a conclusion on that. It's a, certainly, sorry Chair, <coughs> it's a completely fluid situation at the moment. I listened to Mr Gove on Radio 4 in the news this morning 
Um, and for example, he was asked about Erasmus, and he just said no. He, he did four or five questions at the very end. They were very in-depth interview. He was asked about various things like uh, green, green cards for cars. Yes, will be required. Um, um, rights to medical treatment. No, you're not getting it. Uh, Erasmus. No, not getting it. Um, whether that was a negotiating stance or whether it's now the fixed position uh, remains to be seen. The situation and is incredibly uh, fluid at the moment and absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, and in relation to those particular issues, the Irish government have previously said that they will look at making uh, provisions around those for people in the north. They have. Oh. Yeah. I, I think definitely, Chair, it's, it's, it's something to keep an eye on. We're, we're trying to keep tabs on these, and, and our EU affairs manager has been incredible. Um, she seems to be in touch with everybody. So we, we talk a lot to colleagues um, at Westminster. They, they tend to get sight of things first. Yeah. Um, and obviously keeping in touch with colleagues in, in Scotland and Wales um, and whatever soundings are coming out of um, Dublin as well. So we're, we're trying to keep tabs on everything. We do our best to, to bring what information we can back to the department, <coughs> or sorry, the committee. Okay. okay. Um, so moving on then to five point four. At page twenty four of your table pack, there's correspondence from the communities minister in relation to a licensing and registration of clubs. So it's for noting, unless members have any comments. <coughs> Page 25 of your table pack, then there is um, a departmental response in relation to the provision of proposals for health and safety. Have we already dealt with this? Yeah, this is the same issue, um, exit day versus IP completion day. So it, it's just that the current legal advice means that they have to change it to that wording. Okay. Um, but we, we will get more of that. It's just to, to try and be prepared for that. Okay. So moving on then to item number six, there is a provisional comment framework for chemicals and pesticides, um, a clerk's memo at page 34, correspondence from the Minister in relation to the common framework for chemicals and pesticides, page 38, um, a departmental response in relation to common frameworks at page 82, and the latest update for common frameworks at page 91. Um, on the 3rd of December, the Minister approved the provisional common framework for chemicals and pesticides to enable it to move from phase three to phase four of development. Um, and DERA is actually the lead on um, this framework. Peter, is there anything you want to add to that? Chair, we, we, we've actually done very well in terms of, of information. I know um, the ERA committee were briefed last week, I want to say last week, uh, on this, but I think we actually at that point have more papers than they do, um, but they are the lead. We have a couple of um, suggestions around what the committee might want to think about. There, there are references to um, roles that the uh, HSE play and also the councils play. So, Chair, if members are agreeable. We, we look at communicating with them about just what the, the impact of this is on them. Um, we're already aware that uh, HSE have bid for more staff um, simply around trying to cope with the, the um, responsibilities they have under COVID. If there are further responsibilities coming with new regulations, then it's likely that there'll be an impact on their work. So that's kind of the area we need to find out about and pin down on. But in terms of the, um, and there isn't really a process for, for these common frameworks still, but in terms of lead, it, it falls to the ERA committee, and they're still deciding just exactly what approach they want to take this. But I think it would be helpful for us if we can share everything we get with them and also pin down just what the councils and um, HSA are saying, um, just to give that kind of wider picture. Okay, so members are agreed that we'll seek the views of the HSE, Nelga and Solis about the roles that they'll play. Okay, great. Right. Can I just query something in, in the response okay. from the department? So it, it's under company law. Yeah. Um, and it says company law is a transferred matter. Um, and and then it goes on to say that the UK government legislates on behalf of the whole. For common frameworks, this is where things are very complex. So members will be aware that the EU used to legislate, when it, when it talks about company law being a transferred matter, 
What that basically means is the power that, that would have been exercised with the EU goes to London, and then there's um, whatever the common framework then moves to devolved responsibilities and so on. So it's not that anything for us has actually changed. We, we still have the same competence as we have, but what Brussels did is now sitting in London. I think um, in, in Northern Ireland has more of these than any other part of the UK. I think there's something like 160 uh, TEO committees considering this presently. We're, we're due to meet actually the House of Lords Committee on Common Frameworks. I think in Northern Ireland context, there's more than 160 of these. Um, Wales, I think, follows with about 100, and then Scotland is about 70 of them, in terms of areas that were previously uh, EU responsibilities that have presently been returned to London. And then you're into the whole debate about the Sewell Convention, mm -hmm. where does where should this power be exercised? And the House of Lords Committee is actually undertaking uh, consideration of that presently. And I think it's today, actually, we're, we're due to be yes. speaking. TEO Committee is due to be yeah. speaking to the House of Lords Committee. So it's, it's basically the powers that we previously allowed Brussels to exercise on our behalf have been returned to the centre. And the question is, do they go from the centre then back out, out to the regions, or do they stay at the centre? And a lot of that, Chair, um, will also depend on what our final settlement and agreement is too. But, but in the meantime, that's, that's kind of why it's described as a transfer matter. So it's what Brussels did. As, as Mr Stalford says, that is now sitting or will sit in London until we decide exactly how it's going to work. Where it goes. OK. Okay, so then if we move on to item number seven, there is the update on the Shared Prosperity Fund. There's a clerk's memo at page 93, the spend and review 2020 at page 96, a solace NI position paper um, on EU successor funding, <coughs> page 216, the Nilga Eskogen Yeah, report, we're almost with that Eskogen. Um, entitled EU successor funding at page 261 and correspondence from the Minister in relation to the current EU structural and investment funds at page 273. And then the joint letter that we've seen previously from NICVA, WCVA and SCBO to the um, British Chancellor in relation to the Shared Prosperity Fund at page 273, sorry, 275. The committee agreed at its meeting on the 25th that we would include the Shared Prosperity Fund as an item on the agenda. And obviously last week we ran out of time. So the British government will at least match fund the current EU receipts, which is on average around £1.5 billion a year. The funding will be to support people and communities, open up new opportunities and spurring regeneration and innovation. And this funding profile will be set out in the next spending review. The Chancellor announced £220 million will be allocated in 2021-22 to help local areas prepare for the introduction of the Shared Prosperity Fund. The withdrawal agreement between the EU and the UK keeps structural funding until the end of 2020, after which time funding that has already been agreed will be continue to be paid, but no further applications for funding can be made. Okay, so if members have any particular views or um, opinions around this? Chair, can I come in? Yeah, go ahead, Sinead. Yeah, I mean, th this is uh, actually a really important one. There's just so many organisations out there that depend on the European Social Fund uh, in order to survive. And um, I've been told by, by various bodies and organisations that it takes two or three years to kind of develop these programmes. And yet we have a vacuum here uh, and there's a lot of... Um, I suppose uncertainty uh, and uncomfortable um, organisations and bodies that, that just don't know where this is going. Uh, and we've been um, extremely well um, served, should we say, by the, the European uh, Social Fund uh, here in Northern Ireland. Uh, and any type of, of new funding or shared prosperity funding uh, needs to be of this, a similar level. Um, than previously, uh, uh, rather than just being done on a, a even say, for example, a, a Barnet uh, formula that won't serve us very well here in Northern Ireland. So it's just something that we really need to keep an eye on. Um, we have a lot of the third sector um, out there that are actually depending um, on, on this being uh, developed uh, uh, and 
brought forward properly um, so that these bodies and, and, and they do an awful lot of good work. They work with, you know, the disability sector. They work with all the vulnerable sectors out there and they depend on this money. So it's just something I think that we really need to, to concentrate on and push uh, the British government on as well. Uh, I agree with Shane's comments in terms of the, the need for uh, <coughs> certainty and funding to continue, uh, and also for a role for the councils to play in designing this programme. Um, <coughs> councils obviously are a crucial part of our administration, and they're also close to the ground and, and know the needs of the local community as well. Yeah, um, and I guess there is still that lack of information available about what, what it's going to look like um, and the piece about the consultation with organisations, all of those that, um, that Sinead has mentioned and others have mentioned in, that have been so reliant on the, the ESF um, and do really, really important work and that, that is, has been highlighted to us that there hasn't been the kind of necessary consultation or the in-depth consultation that um, these organisations would want. Um, in particular in relation to how it's all going to be administered post um, when it comes in. So, uh, Peter, who can we communicate with directly on this particular issue? Chair, I, I think as a first step, it, it would probably be worth finding out what the stakeholders who wrote to us are aware of or, or, or what their thoughts are so far and whether or not there has been any new um, consultation or engagement with them. Um, I suppose, as, as Mr Stalford highlighted earlier, we are already and have been talking to various committees, particularly in the Lords, who have been incredibly helpful um, in discussing these kinds of issues on, on our behalf and highlighting them uh, at the, the highest levels of government. So we, we continue that um, discussion, but I, I think as an interim point, it might be worth writing to the Secretary of State to effectively advocate on um, behalf of all these stakeholders who have raised the issues within the cabinet mm -hmm. um, as a starting point and to answer perhaps some of the questions that may be too early to answer in terms of how this would work um, regarding quantum. Um, mm -hmm. As has been pointed out um, by, by members but also by stakeholders that have briefed the committee, um, our drawdown of EU funds is greater than we would get as a, a, a Barnet <coughs> allocation. So it's, it's whether that will be taken into account, whether um, the fund would be needs-driven, competitive, <laughs> as the EU funds are themselves, um, where you put forward projects and so on. So there, there's a lot of unanswered questions there, and I think it, it might just be... Um, an idea to get those in front of the Secretary of State so he can raise those at the highest level. Yep, okay. Members are content. Yes, yes. and Claire is looking to come in. Yeah, go ahead, Claire. Hi, thank you. Um, would there be value, uh, and I appreciate it's maybe at a higher level, in writing to the Minister for Communities? Um, I'm just conscious that a lot of the ESF programmes are facilitated by community and voluntary groups who will also access other fundings, namely from the Department uh, for Communities, and there will be an impact on their general uh, functioning if, you know, of this ESF funding. And I Again, it's for a specific pro program, namely in and around skills and, uh, and training. Um, but I, I'm, I'm conscious that you know, involuntary groups who are facilitating these programs are also feeling vulnerable in relation to other funding um, that, that, that they're maybe receiving from department from communities or, or other uh, pots of money. And I just think it all kind of adds up to the bigger picture around their viability moving forward um, to be then able to provide EFSEC if there was ever to be a solution found. Um, and I also think, you know, the, you know, to get the support of the minister behind it, you know, uh, recognising um, that the individuals who this is supporting. So yes, I appreciate it's 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 a training and skills uh, fund. However, I, I think it's who it's helping. Um, you know, I think we need to draw attention to that, um, in particular to to try and um, encourage the, you know this funding moving forward. Chair, um, what what perhaps I could suggest is that the letter that goes to the Secretary of State. Obviously, we reference all of the information we have been sent from from. Um, the organisations that have communicated with us, obviously NICVA and their partners, but also NILGA as well. Um, and the Minister in correspondence with us has highlighted that 
you know, obviously she understands the issues here and has concerns about the ESF funding being replaced, as do other ministers. I know this is an executive um, position that we, we, we must at least have the funding that we've been having, and there, there are arguments being put forward for funding plus. So absolutely, what I would suggest is, is in, in communicating with the stakeholders, finding out their issues, and also highlighting the issues that have been brought to us around the unknown quantities with the Secretary of State, copying that to executive ministers, but, but then using any response from the executive, sorry, from the, the Secretary of State to open dialogue directly with, with executive ministers as to what do we know now and where do we take that? Just because I'm, I'm conscious of, sorry, Chair, I'm, I'm conscious of the executive not necessarily having any more information than we do, but we know what the needs are. Um, thanks, Peter. I suppose where my concern is is that funding from other departments for these groups who access ESF is also uncertain. Um, so it's not, yes, I suppose from, a, uh, from our committee's remit perspective, we, we will be concerned about ESF, but I'm just conscious that you know, community and voluntary groups are, are also facing uncertainty in other funding areas. It will have an impact on their ability to, to take forward ESF if, if it becomes an issue. I suppose what I'm trying to say is... <laughs> It almost feeds in, you know, that they're um, they're struggling with other funding pressures in addition to this one, um, and I do think it would have an impact alongside it. So, I, I understand where you're coming to from in terms of the Secretary of State, but my my understanding would be that you would be you would be discussing ESF specifically, but for for these organisations, they're just looking at their funding and their opportunities to to stay viable. Um, so I, I I I do I nearly think it's a specific issue for communities as well. Cons you know, dovetailing into the ESF issue. Chair, we we can, if members are are, are content, we will um, highlight all those issues with the community communities minister. Chair, something else mm -hmm. has also occurred um, is when we don't know the quantum that's coming here. We we don't know any answers around um, what sort of match funding. We'll also have to look at that. That's not really an issue we've discussed yet. But but obviously, so much of EU drawdown. Um, is a match funding situation. So that's a whole other question um, that we, we, we need, again, the executive to be able to have an idea of what's coming so that they can look at what they need to match fund. And the same with um, councils and so on as well. So, yeah, there, there's a huge issue there. Okay, members content. Sorry, Chair. Just, uh, no, definitely right to the communities, Minister, but th this is a, f a budgetary issue, and EU funding was above what the executive flock grant was, that term. Uh, so uh, I have no problem highlighting the issues with the communities manager, but in reality, there's not going to be the budget in the communities to replace ESF. Okay. I'm also, while well, I'm content to write the Secretary of State, I don't see him as acting on our behalf. <laughs> um, he'll do whatever his political masters tell him to do on Downing Street. So I have no faith in the gentleman whatsoever. Chair, might it also be useful, um, because Mr Stalford had mentioned them earlier, to write to um, Lord Canoel, Chair of the uh, EU Committee and the Lords, who, who have been very helpful in raising issues for us in the past and, and have those direct contacts uh, and are so willing to help if we, if we also um, raise those issues with them. And it may be also useful to raise them and I'm, uh, with the shadow uh, Secretary of State as well. Chair, the, the, the more people who know the issue, the more chance there is of somebody paying attention. Chair, it, it also occurs to me that it's something I'd, I'd been meaning to, to bring up is, is corresponding with our um, sister committees in Scotland and Wales as well. Um, we, we, largely because of COVID, we haven't had the engagement with them that we would have anticipated having. Uh, and I know they've done a lot of work around these issues as well, and particularly as, as um, was raised, Wales has, has a, a very high drawdown of uh, ESF monies like ourselves and will have deep concerns around this. So it might be useful to understand if there's coordinated activity. Yeah. So if members are content, we can, we can write to uh, Lord Canoel, write to our sister committees um, in Scotland and Wales to see just if the issues are parallel, the issues that we have, and if they have any actions that they're taking that we can join in on or that they can suggest, and really just to find out what the picture is with them. Yeah, and Chair, just where does that, it just sort of raises a slightly broader question. Where does that put us in relation to? In the past, we very well would have contacted uh, the appropriate European uh, department as well, uh, because we were a member 
the European Union and we were a region within the European Union and all of that. But once we effectively cease to be that, then, as I understand it, we have no particular powers to write uh, because international affairs are not within our remit. Does that remove us from the, from the arena of international affairs in terms of being able to communicate with the EU? What would the what you know will would effectively the e would the, the UK government block us from doing that in the way I mean, we can't, we can't write to the government of Canada or, 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 or well I know we can but 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 we know it, there's no legal effect in that sense. Chair, it, it's a very interesting arena of policy. Um, as members will be familiar, and especially those who have either been an OFM committee or, or TEO committee, uh, there is an international relations rule. We do have strong international links. Um, I, I certainly have, have clerked committees where we have written many letters to uh, friends abroad. So th there's nothing to stop us. Policy um, is a different matter. I think it has been cast as... Um, for us, locally, we can be friends with whoever we like around the world. Uh, we, we just don't have to develop policy and legislation to, to fit with that. But th there's nothing to stop the committee writing um, mm. and communicating, and um, we, it, it's just haven't. not having the policy. But, but post 1st of January, the relationship has fundamentally changes. changed. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think we need to recognise the appalling state that has put us in. Chair. Yes, indeed. Um, my understanding is that the, the share of prosperity fund is going to be the replacement and it will be driven uh, from the centre, from Westminster and from the government. Um, and, and my concern is that we're just definitely not going to get um, the same uh, type or same level of funding. And that is really, you know, this is not small small uh, amounts of money. This is major amounts of money that could see the collapse of some of um, our, our third sector organisations and bodies. So I do think we need to take whatever measures at all possible. And, but I, I think that the responsibility and, and the, the contacts have to be made uh, within within the UK government because that's where the decision making process and all of this is going to take place. Chair, I suppose the other thing to think about too is, is Peace Plus will continue, so there is there is still a contact there, and it's just how that will work and how it'll be managed. It might just be worth us pinning that down too. Um, that that's probably going to be the most direct and useful contact. Um, but we we have a we have a number of of letters we'll issue, Chair, and then I suppose um, the conversation can be restarted once we have some responses to those, and once we have an idea what others are doing, particularly. Um, what's going on in, in, in sister committees and what's going on in, in uh, London as well, okay. as a start. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, so moving on then to item number eight, there's an SI, the European University Institute EU Exit Regulations 2021. There is um, a correspondence at page 278 of your pack from the Minister. Um, the Minister has received a correspondence from the Minister of State for Universities advising that it's their intention to bring forward the regulations and to ask for the Department's consent along with the other devolved administrations to the laying of this statutory instrument. The European University Institute in Florence was founded in 1972 and is an international centre for postgraduate and postdoctoral studies and research with a European focus. It is not an EU institution, however, currently only EU member states may accede to the Convention. Furthermore, it contains no students um, from the North. As the UK is exiting the EU, that will cease the UK's membership of the European University Institute Convention. The primary purpose of the instrument is to remove redundant legislation from the statute book and provide legal certainty. So the committee doesn't have a role in terms of agreeing the SI and therefore it's not necessary for the committee to have a view on it. They can if they so wanted. if anybody wants to comment. Noted. Okay, item number nine then, SR 2020-295, the Education Student Fees um, and Support Amendment, etc. EU Exit Regulations NI 2020. There is a Clerk's Memo at page 280. Um, the first part of paragraph five of the Clerk's Memo has been duplicated from another SR and should be ignored. Apologies for that, members. Um, page 282 then, there's SR 2020-295, the Education Student Fees and Support Amendment, etc. EU Exit Regulations. 
NI 2020. This statutory rule contains technical amendments to the Principal Higher Education Student Support Regulations, the Education Student Support, support No. 2 Regulations NI 2009, and the regulations which set the persons and higher education courses eligible for home tuition fee charges here in the North. The student fees qualifying courses and persons regulations NI 2007. It continues the status quo for students taking designated higher education courses after the conclusion of the implementation period. The rule will come into operation on the 31st of December. So the um, SL1 was agreed by the committee um, on the 18th of November. So the rule is subject to negative resolution and if members of consent will put the question. Just a broader question. On, on, are students from the South counted as EU students? Technically, yes. So when, when it talks about home, home tuition, mm. um, members are probably aware that you can charge differentiated fees to anyone within your own state, um, as, as already occurs across the different regions in the UK, but you can't charge an, another EU student different fees than what your home students pay. So what this basically means, it's the continuity I talked about earlier, so they're already paying the same fees as our own people, and that will continue beyond the end of the transition period into the new IP period. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, the Committee for the Economy has considered SR 2020-295, the Education Student Fees and Support Amendment, etc., EU Exit Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, and has no objection to the rules, subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report. Great. Thank you. Um, item 10 then is the SR 2020-296, the Education Student Fees and Support Amendment, etc. EU, EU Exit Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. A clerk's memo is at page 297 and the SR is at page 298. Eight, sorry, this statutory rule contains amendments to the principal further education student support regulations, the further education student support eligibility regulations, Northern Ireland 2012. It continues the status quo for students taking designated further education courses after the conclusion of the implementation period. The rule will come into operation on the 31st of December. The SL1 was agreed by the committee again on the 18th of November <coughs> and it is also subject to negative resolution. So if members are content will put the question. Yep. That the Committee for the Economy has considered SR 2020-296, the Education Student Fees and Support Amendment, etc., EU Exit Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, and has no objection to the rule, subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules support. Thank you. Okay, item number... Sorry, Chair, can I just raise another issue, just a broader issue in terms of student finances? Uh, a number of students have contacted me uh, in regards to the student's loan company. Apparently, when they tick the box in terms of identity or put down as Irish, uh, they're asked for further ID, uh, and if their further ID is an Irish passport, then they have to go through a rigmarole. Can we contact the student loan company and ask them why they do that? Um, and they clearly don't understand the situation here, relationships here. Uh, can we yeah, no, contact we, them and ask them what's going on? It should be something that their systems can be sorted with, you know, the sophisticated systems now can do all sorts of amazing stuff. So it's certainly something the committee can raise, yeah. yeah. Okay, item number 11, SL1, Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act 2020, Coronavirus Suspension of Liability for Wrongful Trading and Extension of the Relevant Period Regulations, NI 2020. There is a clerk's memo at page 307 and a correspondence from the DALO at page 308. The Department makes the regulations an exercise of the power conferred by Section 28.1 of the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act 2020. The SR is subject to the confirmatory resolution procedure before the Assembly, and this SR will restore the provision in the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act, suspending directors' liability for wrongful trading and extend the operation of that provision until the 30th of April 2021. This is the Committee's opportunity to consider the policy laid out in the SL1, as it's not possible to amend once the rule has been made and laid in the Assembly business. Office, are members content with the policy direction? Thank you. 
Right. And then we're going to move to item number 15, which is the Education, Student Support, etc. Amendment Regulations NI 2021. There is a clerk's memo at page 41 of your table papers and correspondence from the department at page 42. Um, the department proposes to make this amended statutory rule under powers conferred by Articles 3 and 84 of the Education Student Support NI Order 1998 and Articles 4, 8 and 14, 4 of the Higher Education NI Order 2005. The statutory rule will be subject to negative resolution procedure before the Assembly. And it contains amendments to the Principal Student Support Regulations, the Education Student Support No. 2 Regulations NI 2009. It provides support for students taking designated higher education courses in respect of an academic year beginning on or after the 1st of September 2021. It further amends the Student Fees Qualifying Courses and Persons Regulations 2007 and Education Student Loan Repayment Regulations NI 2009. This is the committee's opportunity to consider the policy set out in the SL1 as it's not possible to amend once the rule has been made and laid in the Assembly Business Office. Are members content with the policy? Yep. Okay, so we're going back then to item 12, which is correspondence at page 312. There's a quarterly report on the analysis of forecast outturn from the Committee for Finance. The papers on the pilot study for the time being. I'm oh, sorry, I'm asking members to note the papers for yes. the time being, <laughs> unless they have any comments they wish to make. Chair, that's just going to be a, a new system for us to scrutinise. Um, budget and the, the processes and various highlights therein. Um, so this is really just info on the pilot study and the Finance Committee will keep us right as to what's going on going forward on that. Okay. So 12.2 then, at page 349, there's a copy of correspondence from the House of Lords EU Committee to the Financial Secretary to the Treasury in respect of an EU proposal for regulation to establish the EU single window environment for customs. Again, is to note, unless members have any comments. Read. Page 353 of your pack, then there's correspondence from the House of Lords EU Committee to the um, Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster in relation to the withdrawal agreement. So again, it's to note. Read. Um, page 355, there's commentary around the 2020 RHINI tariff review from Rani. Um, Peter, maybe we could ask for an update in relation to where things sit with the tariff review. Sure, we have some other correspondence from Rani that we're sitting with. They, they'd indicated there would be another bit coming. We hadn't got it, so if we don't get it, we just bring what 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 other bits they sent us next week. But we just got the impression there'd be something additional. Okay. So um, in the meantime, we write to the department for an update. Okay. Thank you, Chair. At page 356 then, the Human Rights Commission invitation to the launch of the NI Human Rights Commission 2020 annual statement, which is tomorrow at 12.30. So it's just to let, um, if members let the committee office know if they want to attend. Um, and then page 358, there's the 33rd report of the examiner statutory rules. So it's to note unless there's any comments. Mm -hmm. um, at page 28 then of your table pack, there's correspondence from Delradian Gold extending an offer to present to the committee with Professor Neil Gibson on their recently commissioned socio-economic impact review of their project to meet environmental and regulatory standards. Um, members will be aware that there is um, a public inquiry ongoing mm -hmm. in relation to the um, planning application so it wouldn't be appropriate for the committee to engage with the company at this point. So if members are content, we would defer our briefing for now. Yeah. Read. Okay, at page 30 then of the table pack, there's correspondence from the uh, Mighty Group. I think that's as good as anything, yeah. Um, in relation to the acquisition of Enderserve FM and information about the company. So it's to note unless members have any comments. Read. Page 32 of your table pack, then there's correspondence um, from an individual in relation to the localised restrictions grant. The individual is concerned they've not received any correspondence regarding the application and concerned um, that they won't get payments. So if members are content, we'll forward it to the department. Read. Read, yeah. Thank you. Um, page 33, then, um, of table pack, there's correspondence from an individual in relation to schools and universities and the spread of COVID-19 and a whistleblowing complaint. 
and the committee as members will be aware is not the responsible for authority when it comes to whistleblowing complaints so the complaint has been made through the appropriate body and the committee has been copied so it's, it's just to note unless there's any additional comments thank you okay so item number 13 then is any other business um, none has been indicated so unless there's any okay Chair, okay. just what, what's your ahead. understanding of schemes that are coming up for consideration by the executive this week? The minister referenced yesterday in the chamber the company's directors. One was going back to the executive. I'm not yeah, sure. Did she say uh, that was this week? And the wet pubs. Wet pubs is what she did. She mentioned it specifically. The wet pubs and the hotels, I believe, hotels and. She, she, she I think she did reference all three. I'm trying to remember whether it was. This week, I, I suspect it probably is because I think the minister had said that previously. Um, I believe that the, the finance minister believes is bringing forward though these for approval. Is that right? The spend is there, mm. um, the quantum's known, and now it's a case of um, agreement from the executive to proceed because members will recall that these are um, considered executive funds. Yeah. Um, sports systems all belong to the executive um, they're administered by bigger departments but the executive owns them do you require executive approval because it's cross cutting um, I'm going to say yes I think it's this week well I have no doubt I'll be told <coughs> if I'm wrong um, but we'll ask the department as well and we, we'll pop out a message to members later on good, thank you for that thanks Gordon, um, Gary wanting to come in, go ahead Gary Thanks, Chair. It actually it falls under, I suppose, forward work program more than anything else. But I just wanted to maybe request that as a committee we receive a, a deputation or a delegation from DFI planning. Um, I, I, I know that from the macro inquiries into energy and the, the most recent one into the uh, economic impact of COVID, I think it would be useful going forward. Uh, obviously, it will be the new year, but to, to bring forward some uh, expertise from DFA planning to see how they uh, or what role they're going to play in terms of uh, supporting some of the uh, targets that we're trying to meet. Um, so it was just maybe a request that we maybe write to them and ask them to come forward if possible. Chair, if members are content, what we'll do is we'll get a letter to the Minister requesting the officials with the, the criteria we want them to comment on, referencing the two uh, micro inquiry special reports. If members are content, we'll go ahead and do that and schedule it in for the new year. Okay, thank you. Um, and then item number 11 is uh, our date, time and place of next meeting, which is next Wednesday in room 30. And just to remind members that there is an informal meeting with the National Museums of the Royal Navy um, tomorrow at 11 a.m. in relation to HMS Caroline. And attending the meeting will be the Director General, Professor Dominic Tweedle and the Chief of Staff, Captain John Reese, who is also the HMS Caroline Project Director. So, um, just for members' information. Okay, so that's it then. Thank, Thank you. you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.